Guys, I need one favor. Please rate and review this podcast on Apple. If you are listening to it on Apple, we'd be number one, but we don't have enough reviews. We got the downloads, not the reviews. It's bureaucracy. Help us. Every episode of The Gage is brought to you by Bill Fick Ford and the WCRA. Who wants to be Rodeo's next millionaire? It's time. That time again through the WCRA. You can win $1 million by nominating your rides or runs and earning points through the WCRA. Through the Triple Crown of Rodeo, the WCRA will award $1 million in cash prizes to any one athlete or collection of athletes who wins first place in any three consecutive WCRA major rodeos. $1 million is completely up for grabs. The Days of 47 Cowboy Games and Rodeo will be the second stop of the 2021 Triple Crown of Rodeo Series. The event will pay out over $560,000 and will be held July 20th through the 24th in Salt Lake City. Get this, there will be zero entry fees, people. You heard me correctly. No entry fees. The only way to qualify for the Triple Crown of Rodeo event is by nominating your rides and runs with the WCRA. Use promo code GAGE10 for 10% off your next nomination. Again, that promo code is GAGE10 for 10% off your next nomination. To learn more, just visit WCRARodeo.com and learn how you can earn a spot at the Days of 47 Rodeo and possibly be Rodeo's next millionaire. What? Guys, Bill Fick Ford is the number one Super Duty dealer in the country for the fourth year in a row. You guys have heard me rant and rave about Bill Fick Ford for the absolute best buying experience in the car industry, truck industry. Bill Fick Ford's the place to go. I bet you remember the old ad where I said I was getting a new Super Duty. Well, here's the keys for that. Bill Fick Ford delivers, guys. No bull discounts, no bull interest rates, the best buying experience you can get. And if you are not local to Huntsville or the Houston area, he'll deliver it to you just like he did to me. Bill Fick Ford. It doesn't matter if it's your cowboy hat or your equipment, your cowboy hat is part of your equipment. So when you show up feeling good, looking good, you're gonna perform well. I never see us letting our foot off the gas because we're all gas, no brakes, and we work hard and we play even harder and we want as many gold buckles as we can possibly get. We really live it and put everything we have into everything that we do here, whether it's working hard, riding bareback horses, playing on the boat, it's full sin. What's underneath that hat and what's in your heart as a cowboy is what really matters. This is The Gage with host Chance Conradu. Are you freaking serious? It's Conrado. This is The Gage, and I am Chance Conrado. On this episode of the podcast, we are diversifying. We're branching into unknown waters. We are talking to a cutter, not just any cutter, but Taryn Rice. He is a uh, one near $3 million in the sport that is cutting that I know nothing about well that i knew nothing about but i don't know all kinds of things about it now because he informed us very well uh he's actually really funny really cool person super glad that we got to sit down and hang out with him and uh learn something for a change we know rodeo but really don't know much about cow horse stuff and cutting and so it was fun to go into unknown territories check it out good great grand all right well we are diversifying today we've got uh from what I've been told, a master of the art of cutting, and for everybody out there who doesn't know, what might that be means. taking it a little far. Is that? <laughs> yeah, could be. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you've got quite a quite an earning under your belt as far as what you've been able to accomplish in the pen and, and what have you. So I'm Thank really you. looking forward to it. We've had a serious amount of requests to kind of branch and not just talk rodeo politics and then all the other stuff we do, and actually get into some of the cow horse stuff. So I'm happy you're here. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate it. So do enlighten us on who you are, what you do, and uh, what's significant about you in particular. Uh, I am Taryn Rice, live in Poolville, Texas. Uh, we train cutting horses. Get, uh, me and my wife, two kids. Um, we've been been in that spot for five years. Um, be five years this fall, I guess. Um, grew up showing cutting horses, training cutting horses forever. Uh Dad, granddad, uncles, cousins, whole family. That's generational. You gener yeah, exactly. So uh, just grew up in it and um, been doing it since uh, we've been as a professional since I was 20. Yeah. And hey, what is it about cutting, like, in particular, as far as the horse discipline that kind of get your juices flowing? You know, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely a challenge. I mean, you know, as far as 
I mean, that's always keeps you coming back, wanting to do, wanting to do better, wanting to figure it out, you know, trying to, trying to, trying to get better constantly. I mean, really, you know, there's always something, no matter what you're, if you, if you didn't win, you want to, and and even if you do, you want to stay there. So, so I, I think that's what keeps everybody coming back to it is the, it's, it's, it's like golf. The one good swing that you hit on 18 holes, you come back to try to do that again. So you're a golfer too? No, terrible. Yeah. Yeah. That was that one good swing. I was just that about. one yeah, time? Yeah, just that one. Yeah, yeah. That sounds like my golf game. Yeah. One time I tried golf, never came back. Yeah, exactly. It. I don't yeah. know a lot of horse people who play golf because they don't really uh, have time for yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it just, it sounds completely boring in comparison. Yeah. No, it's, it's a blast if you get out there and drink beer and drive your golf cart and hang out, but... Uh, yeah, that one good swing, and it's the same on the same on a cutting horse, or to me, any horse discipline. Yeah, you know, whether you're roping or whatever, it's the one catch, the one move. You want to feel that again, right? Yeah, I mean, because that's one of the significant things about cutting horses is is the way that they move, and that's why people like me who rope and what have you. We were just talking about this before, but are always after cutting rejects for tie down horses and things of that nature. Cause Absolutely. Usually, the horses, I mean, they're compromised so well and have good handle. Yeah, so so the I mean I think the reason that that the rejects work so well in the rodeo world is is they get started at such a young age they get rode every day they have the same same little pattern you go through every day and they get very very disciplined very patterned to it and uh, to me when you get done with a with a cutting horse maybe even a cow horse you can take them to other disciplines and they fall right in you know uh, because they've just that basics and that foundation goes well into about anything else. Yeah. I mean, that's true. Yeah. 100%. I mean, we've had quite a few of them at different times. We usually get a lot of horses off the track because primarily barrel horses, but yeah. uh, totally different when you're riding, you know, a oh, three year old who's been rode by someone who wants to make him a cow horse or a cutter. It's just like a different experience. It feels that's, safe. Almost. That, yeah. It's much safer. So actually we've, we've branched out in, in our cutting horse deal in the last few years and we've been breaking some barrel horses. Really? And that has been a, a, a whole new experience in itself. Just like you're saying the difference in the horses. I mean, even in the, in the whole process of the breaking them, riding them, the, uh, the first ride to the last, it's a, it's a totally different feel that to me, the cutters, you get on them and you're trying to teach them to go and how to travel and these other horses they've got to go and the travel and you're trying to teach them how to stop the whole time you know that it's just two different things there that you can step off of one step on one of those and it's like totally different yeah when you're when you're looking at prospects right like to be high level cutting horses fraternity derby horses whatever it is because it's it's all kind of the same you know, as far as ages and what have you. Right? Absolutely. So, so yeah, we show threes, threes, fours, five, sixes are your, you know, aged events. Yep. And then they have, have events for older horses open. also that are open. Yep. Yeah. So when you're, when you're looking at a two year old or, or looking at a set of papers to buy a horse, I mean, what is it that you're looking for as far as that horse goes to see if they transition well into, you know, being a high level cutter? You know, just as, as far as looking at the papers, you never know, you know, a, a good horse is where you find it. I mean, obviously, you know, we have certain horses that we get along with better, you know, than, than other breeds, you know, uh, there's certain breeds that I definitely want to look for that I've had success on that I get along with stuff like that. You want to look for, you know, good mom and, you know, all, all, all this, pretty much any of the studs that you go and breed to, they were all winners. They're all good. They're all well-bred. They're all good looking, you know, that all type of stuff comes with that the but you know you want to find you a, a mare that's was good minded and and won quite a bit of money and you can kind of go from there sure yeah i mean it's the same concept and I'm, obviously there's certain certain sires and and bloodlines that trend and just bring a certain dollar amount just like barrel horses or absolutely well, i mean some of the rope horses are actually the same as the cutters but, oh definitely uh, yeah i mean it's it's interesting right because we were just talking about this before but Everybody stays in their own lane. They don't really cross too much. Like there's this one time a year, the Congress and what have you, where everything's kind of in one building, but rodeo people don't really go to that, you know, unless they're showing for somebody. Exactly. And so our, our waves never cross. So this no is doubt. really interesting. It's like, Hey, we all have saddles. We all wear boots, hats and ride horses, but we don't know a whole lot about it. Yeah, either. no, for sure. No. It, yeah, definitely. It's been, uh, you know, with the, with the fraternity deal that they're doing in the, in the, Kef roping and the breakaway stuff. Yep. That, you know, there's been a bunch of people calling trying to buy three year olds to to go to that and along with the Ruby Buckle. Yep. You know, they they've got a couple of deals like that. So we've been meeting some Kef ropers that that previously we 
we never met that are asking for young horses. Yeah. So yeah. That's, I so, mean, you know, that's been a kind of cool it's day. real tough to find tie down horses right now. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's yeah. People are going to Brazil and they're still not finding them in Brazil. Yeah. You know, it's just, there's not a lot of stones left to turn over. Yeah. Yeah. Older horses or younger horses? I mean, finished horses is, is the problem. I mean, yeah, I you can, you, yeah. you can always kind of find prospects, right. Or at least attempt to, yeah. you know, but yeah, I mean, find and finish tie down horses has a lot to do with the breakaway because you need half a horse that can bring the same money. Exactly. So yeah. A lot of money in the breakaway deal right now. Creates a hole in the marketplace. So it's not surprising you're getting those calls. Yeah, for sure. What, uh, so what is, what is kind of the, normally we don't get into this, but I'm really fascinated by it just cause I just, I seriously have never watched cutting in my entire life. I, mean, I, I watched some on YouTube today, but I, I did that last yesterday. I'm like, what's going on? How do you, my biggest question for at least with cutting is how does this scoring work? Cause I'm very confused. All right. So there's uh, depending on where you go, there's anywhere from one to five judges. We've got several different systems. You've got your, you got a one judge system, two judge, three judge, or a five judge. So obviously the one judge system, the, the judge judges each run from 60 to 80 and, uh, highest score wins you can also use half points um two judge system they add the two scores together three score system the same thing and but when you go to five all five judges judge it from 60 to 80 and then they drop the high and the low to come up with your the the three the three middle ones add up to your you know 225 219 whatever does that make sense a little bit picking that up yeah, i'm picking that up it's the i think the other question would be how where do the where how do they judge it in terms of what all right the horse so does? so they want to see they want to see a a horse and rider that that get two to three cows out in front of them as clean as possible and by that i mean not running through the herd not chasing them around not jerking their horse you know anything uh, real ugly like that not you know the horse not flipping his head upside down you want to come through the herd quiet, get one by itself, and then put your hand down. Now, once we get to that point, then they judge you on on how your horse stops, how well he reads the cow, um, and by that I mean you don't want to you don't want your horse going the the opposite way of the cow. You know, if your horse cow's going right, left, right, left, you want your horse doing the exact same instead of going left, right. You know, they don't need to be. They call that a miss, and so for every miss, every time your horse goes the opposite way of the cow, that's a one point penalty. So, um, you know, you've got a, a, a whole lot of penalty boxes, but there's also a whole lot of plus boxes. And, you know, the eye appeal, they want a horse that's really bright-eared and looking at the cow, and they want them to, you know, get in the ground, use their hocks, get down low, turn pretty. Preferably you want them to, to bring their nose through the turn first. You know, there's then there's 100 different styles or 200, but there's – pretty much all of them go the same. You want them to go really fast, stop really hard, stay in the ground in that stop, same as like a calf horse. You want them to stay in that ground, and then the cow goes the other way, and then bring their nose and reach and go the other way and go do it again. Yeah, what he said. Yeah, <laughs> Too much? No, no. I mean, uh, it's it, it's, it's, it's really unique. So so the one thing, because Ty's got to see a lot of rodeo, there's a lot more horse involved in, in this stuff than some of the other things. Like, right, if you watch bulldogging or, or tie down, there's a lot going on with the person. I mean, they're really trying to showcase the horse more than anything. That's what's kind of fascinating about yeah, it. Yeah, no, def- definitely, yeah. So it's definitely that you want to, you know, showcase the 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 horse. Um, so, like, one of the, the biggest misconceptions is, is that the horse – does it all on his own. You know, you, you obviously you have your hand up while you're walking through the herd. You rein them around, tell them what cow you want, you know, get them on the cow. But then you put your hand down. Everybody's like, well, then it's just up to the horse. But that's, you can use your feet all you want. So there's so many different ways of helping them and telling them where to go and, and how to, you know, control them there with your feet. But at the same time, they have to be they have to be watching the cow and doing the best they can to figure out what it's going to do also because it takes – it takes all of your thoughts to to figure it out and the horse you know it t- i mean it takes a it takes a lot and it takes a a great horse to to f- figure that out to figure out what another animal's going to do with without you know it's not the same pattern team roping steer wrestling calf roping any of that it's the exact same pattern yep you're going you know team roping you're going to run out here we're going to rope it and you're going to go left and we're going to turn around that's every time you know steer wrestling we're going to run the straight lines fast you can yeah, obviously there's a lot of intricacies about it that I don't understand, but <laughs> but you know, it's the same pattern. Steers running straight, hopefully. In this, it changes 
every time, constantly. It's changing. So it takes a exceptional horse to to figure out all those changes and learn how to deal with it. Yeah, I mean that that's a fact. I mean, yeah, there's margin marginal errors and things that can happen in tie down Absolutely. or team roping or, you know, I mean barrel racing certainly the same pattern every time. I don't think they've ever changed it, but no. uh, yeah, it. Uh, it is fascinating, right? Because you're totally at the mercy of whatever that heifer wants to do. Exactly. At any given yeah. time. And they've, I mean, if you see it, they do some weird shit. They will sometimes. come up. Yes, absolutely. No, that, I mean, you know, cows are supposed to be herding animals. They're going to figure out any way they can to get back to the herd. And it, like I said, it takes an exceptional horse to figure out how to keep them away from it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because if you do watch it, right. And you don't, you don't have any horsemanship in your background or haven't spent a lot of time on horsemanship. A lot of people don't, they kind of like skip over that, right. If people Absolutely. come in and your family's not in it. It's like you, we all see these people, right? Like they want to get into rodeo. Maybe it's barrel racing, maybe it's cutting and they didn't really have a foundation of horsemanship first. Definitely. Like in my family, like we didn't get to rope. We didn't get to run barrel horses or do any of that. We had to ride colts at like six. Yeah. And like, hey, you're going to learn. You just grew up riding. Yeah. Yeah, not compete. You just were riding. But I'm sure you've yeah. had lots of clients like this. They're like, hey, I want to do what you're doing. And no matter how hard you try, like, you can't get that feel on them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, a lot of people come in and and they're, they're business men or business women or whatever. And, yeah, they want to they wanna do that. But they have no background in horsemanship, like yep. you said, in, in, just, in just basic riding, you yep. know. Yeah. Uh, and that's where people that start at a young age have such an advantage. They go through all that, you know, like my daughter is six years old and she's, she's been riding for the last two years. Well, so she's learning every day that she rides just right. She's not even, she's barely started competing. She's shown a couple of times, but it's like a, there's no, there's no expectations of winning right now. We're just learning to ride and we're learning to, you know, go through that type of thing where these people come in and they want to go compete. You know, and they miss out on all of that, that, that a lot of these people are fortunate enough to learn at a young age. Like you're talking about, you're riding colts at six, you yep. know, you're out here riding. So you've got to learn how to get this colt to go where you want it to and pull Hindsight, it. Hindsight, not great parenting. Though. Yeah, no, no, yeah. it's definitely, definitely not, not dangerous. Good parenting. But it, it, but when you get older, you know how to ride. You do. Yeah. Pending you are still together enough to yeah, ever ride exactly. again, which was definitely the case for me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Your back is not that. It's not doing that great. No, it's not doing great. No, not right now. But that's again, what happens. Again, I can get you a pillow for that chair. <laughs> I had a horse flip over on me in the box a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. Never the same again. Yeah. It's like when a when a saddle lands on you in a certain way. It's not like, good. Just things don't come back normal for some reason. No. Yeah. No, yeah. Back's not meant to put up with that. No. Yeah. Turns out it wants to be straight. It's supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. Horses have other plans. They weigh a thousand pounds after all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I've only I've only got a few broken bones. Really? Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. was your biggest wreck? What was your biggest blow up? <sighs> On a horse? Yeah. I don't know. Too many to count. Really? <laughs> yeah. The, the, I mean, the only one hospital that, level blow ups. Uh, which one? The worst the one. Worst one. Uh, concussion. I got uh, at a very young age, like you were saying. Probably mm -hmm. I I don't even know how old I would have been. Uh, eight to ten, eight to eleven, somewhere in there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the horse got out from under me at a show. I um, was riding across the gravel parking lot, and uh, my friends got ahead of me, couldn't catch up, and uh, kicked him harder than I needed to, and he, he went. He did exactly what I told him to, and I went off the back and hit my head. And Ooh. Concussion. I was blind for a couple hours, and, uh, yeah, messed quite a bit of stuff up at that time, but nothing serious. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it just messed mess my head up. Just yeah, bit. just for a little while, though. That he, was good. He, Last, he, he, lasting effects, I've had four broken legs. Yeah. Three, Ooh. three, three broken legs, four broken bones. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. That, that's been a little bit. I've got, ask anybody that knows me even remotely. And one of the most characterizing things of me is I have very crooked legs because of it. <laughs> yeah. I've yeah. been made fun of a lot. Bow <laughs> bo bo legs. Yeah. You, anybody you, who rides horses long enough, you just develop that. Especially def if you start definitely. As a kid. Well then add some broken bones in riding when yep. the doctor tells you not to and yeah, you'll really get crooked. You're messed up. Yeah, yeah, what he didn't tell you about the head injury is his name was Terrence before that happened, and he could never say his name right <laughs> yeah, again, now so it's they not. changed it. Yeah, now it's not, exactly. <laughs> What's your name? So, Terrence. Yeah, yeah shorten right. it. They had to You're not it. supposed to smash your head against the pavement, turns No, out. not at all. Not at all. You hear about crooked noses. I've never heard about crooked legs until now. Mm -hmm. so he hasn't hung around enough me. cowboys of any kind. Exactly. Every, go see a good old boy, and, I mean, it looks like a egg. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah. 
I'll it's, show I'll show y'all here a little bit when we stand up. Yeah, <laughs> he'll show you what bull legs really look exactly. like. Exactly. Yeah. There's a sad misconception around it. Pretty crooked. Yeah. What the? So you went pro when you were. What were the steps to go? You just buy a card. How do you? No, you just start showing in the open. Really? Yeah. So you just you just, you just start getting beat. Yeah, yeah. that's how you do it. Because yeah. you you do hear. Like, a lot of people complain about, like, people who do cutting, like, oh, it's political, it's this, it's that. I've had a lot of people that I know who, amateur, try to go in the open, oh, that's political. Like, where does that, miscon- is that a misconception? Where does that come from? Yeah, it's a, it, to me, it is. Yeah. I mean, it, to me, it's a huge misconception. And is it an excuse, maybe? That think? is an ex- yeah. That's an excuse. Yeah, definitely. So, so no, I mean, I understand. I know there's differences as far as like the the rodeo and stuff. You get to you know buy your permit, fill your permit, and I don't really understand exactly how all that works. But there are some steps to, you know, being being at a top level. You know, I kind of fill you'll have to fill me in on that. But I know there are some steps into it's getting all into financial. That. Yeah, exactly. For the most part. Well, I mean, in this, there's there's nothing financial about that. You just yeah. the that's the like if you go to a show, the open is the open. And right. that means anybody can show in it. Yep. It's open. So just you just start showing. And, you know, hopefully, like in our case, um, I worked for my dad, who's a horse trainer, and uh, uh, me and Katie got married, and I was working for dad at the time. And at that point, I was showing in the non-pro, So which means you own your own horses, and you can only show yours. You can't train for the public. You, can't, you know, you can't train for money. So... At that time, I had my own horses. What happens if you do? Like, what if they find out ah, you're moonlighting? You get kicked out of the non-pro, and you have yeah. to go, and you have to start showing in the open. So your option is, hey, go in the open or do nothing, or do nothing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, so at that point, you know, I was I was eighteen, nineteen, showing in the non-pro, had been, you know, through the youth and blah 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 blah. Show there, and uh, uh, Dad said, you know, you can need to make some more money. So here's a group of horses that his clients own, and go show them. Yeah. So you start showing in the open when somebody else owns your horse. Yeah. So, so basically your dad kind of groomed you or pushed you to it. Was he, oh, was he your main coach? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we grew up doing it forever uh, yeah. with dad, you know, that was the, he was the only coach at that point. Right. And, uh, uh, yeah, life coach, cutting coach, whatever, and the, through the whole thing. And then better life coach, better cutting coach, uh, better life coach as far as, uh, uh, explaining stuff, the cutting coaching, was probably rougher. More screaming. More screaming. Yeah. Oh, yeah, dumbass. That's what my a dad. A lot. Did. Yep. Yeah. A lot. And, and yeah. And and a lot worse. And a lot of it, you know. Um, also very supportive at the same time, but definitely gonna get in a lot of trouble. Uh, I don't feel like in the in the life coaching there was as much of that. It was more explanations and an example. Here's Seemed like a different guy when he was doing that, more patient. Well, maybe more no. <sighs> I don't, I don't know. I think, like I said, I think he just led by example more or less on that. Yeah. And, you know, follow in or you get whipped, you know, so. Yep. Yeah. I do. That's, yeah. That's kind of how that went. Yeah. As far as the, the cutting, there was, yeah, it was that, uh, or any, anything outside of that, whether it was baseball or cutting or whatever. Yeah. It was. Oh, uh, you played baseball too? We did. Yeah. At that, at that time when we lived there, lived there at the house and we're younger and that was, dad was always our coach. So. We spent a lot of time with Dad. It was a lot of fun. Oh, he coached baseball too. Oh yeah, oh, that's definitely. Pretty, cool. pretty intense on the baseball. Same as the cutting. Really? Yeah. Those are his two sports. Those are his two sports. Yep. Yep. Which he also now he trains cow horses and he ropes. I mean, Dad's a very good roper. He's one of the world's greatest horsemen. Snaffle, Biff, Turd, anything in the cut, anything in the cutting cow horse world there is to win, he's done it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah he's, he's at, pretty well known. That's yeah, for definitely. Sure. But at that time, it was uh, it was baseball and cutting. Yeah, that was that was all we did when was younger. I mean, it doesn't sound that bad. No, no, it was great. Yeah, no, it was awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. But the but the style of coaching it was just rougher than <laughs> than what uh, you know than what most get to hear. I mean, it probably what makes people successful, right? Because I mean, there's there's a distinctive difference between people who grew up like that and then absolutely say didn't grow up like that. Absolutely, yeah, we see a lot of that nowadays. Absolutely, and it's much easier to learn like that if you have somebody that coaches in a more aggressive manner mm-hmm. than if you do in somebody that's very passive about it. And there's people that can take one style or the other. And you know, as a trainer, as a coach, doing this now, you have to figure out which people are which. You know, otherwise you lose clients. Do you do quite a few clinics? Um, we have done. We have done some. I, it's not something that I do a lot. Um, I I enjoy it. Um, you it's, like teaching people? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's a lot of fun. You get to you know you, you go to these clinics. You get to meet new people. We've there's there's going to be one to two people at every clinic that you don't enjoy, and there's going to be three or four that become lifelong friends. You know, there's there's a lot more good than there is bad. Yeah. You know, and for I'm not saying that those other people are bad. There's just some people that you know your personalities clash or your coaching style clashes or whatever, and they don't learn. There's always somebody that's smarter than you that came to your clinic. And uh, that doesn't make it much fun. But yeah. the ones that are there to learn and, and that are good and ask questions, it's it's a lot of fun. It's like, why did you sign up for the clinic? Yeah. I guess you don't want to learn. You no, came you're to already me. better than me. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. let's switch places. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, and there's and that's I think that's in anything, you know, that, that you're going to have somebody that's pretty smart. Yeah. Everywhere. Absolutely. Yeah, they're really close to us sometimes, too. Yeah. You can't get them away. Yeah. Hey. I feel like we're fixing to get political. Hi, hi. We're fixing to get political now. You having fun? Me, me just taking pictures? No, you're doing great. Usually, usually, like, oops, oh, sorry, I forgot to take the pictures. Can everybody put the headphones back I, on? I, pretend I, to talk. I, I learned my lesson you from did. the from the multiple times I've done this. Yeah, like 35 times. Not 35, yeah. maybe 10. It was a lot. 10 at most. So, back to what we were talking about. <laughs> so. Went pro at 20, started going. I mean, you've won $2.6 million or or more. I'm not really sure where that's at. I don't know if you track LTE. Some people do, but. Yeah, so no, not really. But, Somewhere I there. mean, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of people in cutting who win that much. But, I mean, as a whole, if you look at, like, horsemen, I mean, that's that's serious. I mean, you're up there with upper echelon people, you know. There's not a whole lot of barrel racers who've won that much, and certainly not a lot of ropers. I mean, so it's pretty impressive when well, you hear so, I mean, I, that kind of winning. Well, thank you. I, I don't keep up with the. I don't I mean that. Do the ropers even keep up with the earnings and the barrel rate? More of the, uh, more of the accolades. So the barrel barrel horses do. I mean, they, they keep track of all-time money earners and all that. It's like once a year in their barrel horse news, they post yeah. it. But uh, no, I mean, not really, unless you're Trevor Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then you just know. Or J.B. Mooney if you're a bull rider and you're yeah. just like a $7 million cowboy. Yeah, but, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, so looking at, looking at their stuff, it looks like they just – it's the anything that's listed. It's the accolades, you know, eight time world champion, you know, blah 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 blah. It's yeah. not necessarily the well, money. Yearly, yearly, it's all based on money, right? Your world champion in anything, right? Your absolutely, it's, it's all based on that dollar amount. You know? Yeah. So I guess they just add it. They just year. add that. Yeah. 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 It's such no, a, it's so. a it's a misconception though that number. I mean, how many how many cuttings do you go to a year? We try to go to probably one aged event a month so so 12 you know we go to the fraternity uh fraternity super stakes derby and bi those are our four biggest um three of them in fort worth one of them in tulsa Mm -hmm. um generally go to vegas a couple of times a year um a couple other you know there's a couple in ardmore we go to maybe abilene you know there's a few but about 12 of those and then there's jillions of smaller cuttings called weekend shows that we go to you know, in between to, to tune up. Yeah, to jackpot try to get, Jackpot, things, exactly. Yeah. Yep. And you go to those, you know, to try to try to fine-tune, get everything ready to go to the big ones. So I would say 12 of the age events and then the probably 10 to 20 of the others, you know, in between them. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's super refined and dialed in, whereas rodeo, like at the end of a rodeo count, you might have 80 to 90 rodeos in a year. It's a totally different road. It's interesting. Definitely, definitely. That sounds nice. Yes. So if you can be successful enough at it, it's it's uh it's a lot easier to go to the to the big age events if you can win enough money. Yeah. Um you know, the to me if you if if I have a good year and I'm winning and I'm doing good, then I can go to fewer shows because right. you're making more money, you know, less you win, the more I got to go to try to win. So yeah. so yeah, it, it's if you can the more, the better you do, then the less you can go, and then it's nicer. You stay at home a little bit more. Right. And, I mean, so is the big portion of your guys' program, I mean, is that what you're trying to do? Like, the majority of your income, if you're a cutting horse trainer, is those winnings, or is it, Absolutely. you know, the outside horses and things no, like that? No, it's more winnings. Yeah. Um, you know, you've got a the, – the training of the horses is more or less a break-even. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you get it by the time you pay your help, pay for your place, pay for your trucks, trailers, going through alt feed, cows, cow feed, yep. shaving, the whole deal. That that money's pretty well gone. If you have a month when you make a little on that, you're lucky, killing it. Yeah, you're exactly. You're pumped. Yep. Um, most of your money that if you try to put anything back or you know need a new truck, need a new trailer, whatever, it's going to come from winnings or selling horses. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Kate, are you the bookkeeper? Yep. 
I figured you would. I brought the bookkeeper. Yeah. Keeps the balance sheets going. Absolutely. That's yeah. A lot of a lot of cowboys don't remember to do that part. No, I'm really bad at it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think very many men are good at it. Period. No, no, not at all. Not at all. What was the first like big like major thing that you won? Um, the first aged event I won was uh, was the Brazos Bash in uh, in Weatherford. There, uh, the first very big one was the Futurity, 2012. Yeah, here in Fort Worth. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's like the NFR for you. Yeah, that's, that's basically it. Yeah, right? the, yeah, the fraternity's our biggest one. So you win that, and then you're kind of, what's, well, I mean, how much do you win for that? Because it's that, a single prize, right? Yeah, it's not like that, it's yeah, 10 that, days that like the paid, NFR uh, like that, that year it paid 205 Wow. Yeah, 205000 That's pretty so, great. Yeah, and I actually, I actually split it, uh, me and my uncle actually tied to win it that year really so, yeah so it, it would have paid more we both got 205 so i don't remember what the what first was and second was but we both got 205 so normally it pays like upwards yeah i think this year i think this like year that. it paid 256 you really? know so yeah somewhere in there oh so so you each of you got 205 or you split the two no we each got 205 really yeah yeah, it pays. Huh. It pays good. Yeah, so it. Yeah, like this year it paid two fifty six. It's been down depending on the number of entries. You know, uh, it's at times it's been down to like one seventy here in the in you know the last few years. But this year with the NFR coming to Texas, we got a it lot was of wild. It was all going it was, on. Yeah, it was all awesome. time, and it was great for us. We got a lot of their vendors. You know, Cowboy Christmas and stuff set up at at the facility yeah. there at Will yeah, Rogers that we had leased. So that so then we made more money off of that. We right. got more people in, so everybody made more money. So then all of our ticket sales, everything went up for us too. So we our deal paid more also. Yeah. So it was good. Yeah, it was it was great for us. Yeah, pretty interesting. I mean so there is there added money and sponsor money that goes in that's not just entry fees obviously. No. no. Yeah. So there's uh yeah, you have your sponsors and your added money, you know, stuff like that. Um the the way the the way the NCHA is set up right now, I think the sponsors and the and the added money and stuff pretty much goes to pay for everything outside of all that stuff, mm-hmm. and the uh, and the in, pretty much the total entry fee goes to the purse. I think is the way it's kind of set up at the moment. Yeah, but how many places do they pay? So at the Futurity, um, they we usually start anywhere from with in, like in the first go around of the open, uh, anywhere from five to six hundred. Um, second go around, they go down to 240, and the semifinals is uh, 65, I think, uh, or six, maybe 60, and then we go to 20. So the to get any money, you got to get in the semifinals, and uh, like I said, depending on entries, number of entries and stuff, that pays anywhere from usually 10 to 15, uh, and then to get in the finals, to get in that top 20, uh, 20th place, I think, is usually around 30. Something like that, mm. yeah. And then they, but like I say, they pay from twenty one down to you know sixty five or whatever it is. They get another ten grand there. Sure, those guys do. Okay, I mean, so you get a pretty good chance of at least getting some expenses covered and things of that nature. Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Huh. So you want to talk politics? You did say that. Um, in fact, you were pushing really hard for not talk about cutting horses at all, just politics. Yeah, awesome. And you wore your blue shirt, so I'm confused by which party you represent. Uh, Straight Republican. Oh, just happened to be a blue shirt. This is a circumstance. This is yeah, this is a circumstance. I like blue. <laughs> you, you, yeah, yeah. You know, everyone doesn't wear the color. No, right? I didn't know that. No, I am sorry. I should have wore red. I, had, had I have known that this was a political podcast, I would have wore. It's more red. political than anything. It just like, so happens you do cutting horse stuff. I mean, yeah, I, I didn't know we, that. We, we came in here, here to talk politics. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Yeah, nice. I, I wasn't the, sure. The cutting was just the opener. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of politicians who do cutting. I got you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I just wore the wrong color. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. it happens. It goes well with my eyes, you know. It Whatever. does. You got yeah. nice eyes. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's probably why she likes you so much. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. When did you guys meet, by the way? Uh, we were seven, seventeen, probably seventeen. Yeah. Got together at seventeen or met at seventeen? Uh, both, same time. Same time. Exactly. Yeah. Like, hey, let's get together, and that was the whole deal. That was it. Were you guys in there high school was, together? Nope, nope. Katie went to high school down the road. I was actually homeschooled. Um, I went to school through seventh grade and then started homeschooling eighth grade on. Uh, Katie went to school in Miami, graduated with a class of ten. Ten people. Yeah, huge, huge school. And um, so there was a, a man that worked for my dad at the time, a man named Marshall Long, and he actually married a cousin of Katie's. And Marshall, we grew up together, and then he came to work for dad. I think he worked for dad for like six or seven years. And uh, uh, he introduced us. Yeah. And uh, – Went from there. 
we dated for a year and a half, year and a half, got married. We got married when we were both 19. You got married at 19 years old? married at 19. We're 32. No Been married 13 years this year. 19. Mm-hmm. Like, not. I don't think that's, that's not really a thing. That's some not old school really stuff. Not really anymore. That is old school. W- were either of your parents adverse to that? Be like, whoa, what are you guys doing? Hey. 19 years old? No. They all of they they did too. When my dad got married, he was 18, my mom was 20, and uh, her parents the same. I think so, 18 and 20. Yeah. So they were just like, "All right, go for it." That's, that's what we did. Yeah, that's just the way it was. Yeah. I I, I don't think I know anybody who got married that young. Yeah. yeah Maybe. No. Maybe like some military people, but they didn't stay married. <laughs> they didn't stay married. Yeah. Nope, those military guys never keep their wives. Is that right? It seems like it. Why is that? I don't know. It's just a joke that goes around. I don't know. And now you're poking holes in my joke. I'm starting to get uncomfortable, and I'm not really sure. I didn't know if there was something political about it. No. Well, I mean, maybe the military. Maybe. But, yeah. you know, they always make the joke like, uh, you know, they, they get married so they can move off base, and then their wife disappear on and them. And then I got you. I got you. There you go. See, I didn't know that rule. Yeah. If you know mili- any military people, I've got several buddies, all of them married, like, within... <sighs> I don't know, like a few months of getting out of their basic training to some girl, like they definitely shouldn't have married, mm-hmm. and they're definitely not married now. I got gotcha. you. None of them. There you go. Like I got three friends. None of them stayed married. None of them stayed married. No, not yeah. even like a year. And after. they were that. Yet you're you're blaming it on the military or the age? Uh, I think it was the rash decision making. Probably uh-huh. it's like they wanted to not live in the barracks so bad that they got married. Because gotcha. if you if you get married, you don't have to stay in the barracks. You can you get go. a house and. You know, use a VA loan and like live on the base, but like in a house or something like that. uh So they do that. Of course, they're always gone. So it's a bad idea. It was like a two and a half month relationship. So the women get estranged. They leave. Back to the back to the barracks, or they get to keep their house. You know what? I guess I should ask that. I guess I didn't pay attention after that. I was more like, I told you you shouldn't marry her. Look what happened. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it didn't work. It didn't work. But yeah. Anyway, we we do talk politics on this show. Probably way more than any Western, probably more than they do on Cow Horse Full Contact, that's for sure. You've probably been on that podcast, right? No, I have not. I've listened to it quite a bit. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Know all them guys, but yeah. uh, but no, never been on. Oh. Well, that's kind of rude of them. Yeah. Do they not know who you are? Uh, yeah, I don't know. How rude. They've, never, they've just never asked. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm a bad speaker. I don't know. I don't think I don't, so. I don't, I, don't di- I don't dive into that stuff, you know. Leave those stones unturned, you know. That's a good idea. Yeah. I shouldn't be stirring. Hey, why? Why haven't you had me? You don't want. To, you might get an answer you don't want to know. That's a good point. Uh-huh. Maybe yeah, Ryan just, Moats can tell him. Yeah, exactly. Because you can't rope that good. Maybe that's why. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah. I bet. So you we're gonna can. go. I there. bet you Ryan I couldn't stay on a cutter. I mentioned Ryan making fun of me for roping poorly one time, and you're gonna bring that up on here. Uh, yeah, I yeah. But reach for things. But I will say this: I rope better than he cuts because at least I do attempt it. That's a good point. So straight at you, Ryan. That's right there. Would, but could you grow a beard like that? Absolutely not. Yeah. No. Not 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 in the next ten years. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Then maybe you and I have the same facial genetics because I could never. Yeah. Yeah. No, not it just even, wouldn't happen. Not with any help. Probably not even with like a hair transplant. I still couldn't. No, me neither. I don't think so. Yeah. Uh. Uh-uh. Not so, that I would want to. I mean, he's ugly as hell with it. But whatever. <laughs> you know. Hey. Yeah. I'm just saying. Sometimes yeah. you just gotta say it. Yeah. No. That. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Any time that we get to make fun of Ryan, we we'll do it. Yeah, yeah. Because he's I'm going to us. Because he's going to us. Yeah, I'm actually I'm actually for that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, he he made fun of my lack of facial hair actually when yes, he was he here did. last Yes, he did. I listened to it. So, yeah. Hmm. Okay. All so right. See, that's why we throw that's it. That's why at we're him. here. Exactly. So he's probably not going to hear this, but oh yeah, he will because I'm going to send it to him. Good. <laughs> hey Riley, 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 cut a clip of this just for Ryan. Then he doesn't have to listen to the whole yeah. podcast to get here. We need. Yes, he needs it. Yep, Definitely. he does. Yeah, someone's got to bring him down a notch. Exactly. Now, next year at the RMI, we are going to catch hell after this, but that's okay. <laughs> We're going to catch hell for something anyways. It's the nature yeah, of the business. Exactly. That's first time first time I break out or miss, he's going to say something. So, yep. here we go. I'm getting a jump. Makes it more fun. Exactly. What, how many horses do you guys have Like at any given time? I, I mean, I've been to cutting places, and it always seems like there's way more horses there than... Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a lot. Um, I'm going to say there's probably... 60, 60 to 65 at the house right now. Really? How, m- how much help do you guys have? Um, me, Katie, uh, two guys that uh, that help us ride, and uh, and a feeder stall cleaner. So just the, just the five of us. Yeah. For comparison, uh, what's the usually for barrel for what like Cody's done? Number of horses? Like no one, just you. I'm not I'm trying. I'm, 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 no, 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 I'm like no help. No help. No, my mom has a helper, but that's different. Not for helpers, I mean a uh, number of horses. 
Oh, uh, I don't know. I think, I mean, there were times where we had like 50 head of horses. Terrible idea. A lot of brood mares, which don't make money. It's a terrible idea. Yeah. Out of all of those horses, there's like six of them that paid for the rest. That's about the way it goes in our deal, too. So, yeah. so you need the numbers. Yeah. Thank you very much, by the way. You yeah. need the numbers to pay the bills, to sort through the horses and try to find the good ones. Yeah. But in the end, yeah, there's going to be six to ten that pay for the, you know, that, that make the money. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all the same concept for you who don't understand. You know, it's it's like athletes, just like like professional athletes. Like, they're, not all horses are created equal. There's a bunch of dumps Absolutely out there, and not. you really have to weed through. There's a lot of trial and error. Well, I mean, there's some people, and I'm sure it's the same in cutting, but they may have one, like, great horse ever. They have their one moment to shine, and then you never see them again because they just never have the means or the luck to get that horse again. So, all right, going back, tough. Going back, so what, what really makes a horse, for my stupidity and horse knowledge, what makes a, what makes a cutting horse reject? Like what makes them makes them become a reject? Should we define the word reject, reject. first? Or? All right. So reject reject cutting horse is something that a trainer and or owner wanted to sell because they either weren't good enough or were too late in being trained for whatever reason, and uh, that's what we try to sell to the ropers. Why'd you point over here? How do you know he's not a roper? Because you've been saying he wasn't. You said he didn't know anything about horses. Maybe it was a bait and switch this whole time. Well, maybe he knows maybe everything. We sell to the ropers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so it's a good foundation, right? So anytime you can, like, acquire a horse like that, like, you're looking for a foundation of training, right? You're not necessarily looking for them to be the best necessarily. You know, at least they don't start that way. But if it, just because the horse didn't work for cutting or reining or something doesn't mean you doesn't can't mean take. they're Yeah, it doesn't mean they're a bad horse. It, may, it just may not be their thing, right? So horses are like people. Like, not everybody wants to play baseball or football. I mean, you're going to have certain horses who definitely don't want to run barrels. You have horses that are not going to turn a steer no matter what you do. And you have horses who just won't stop, right? And so you just kind of have to find a path for them. And then you have horses who will do nothing. So you just, it's trial and error. A lot of trial and error. Yeah. Financially, most of all. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. But like the what what makes a horse good in any discipline is being good minded, meaning that you can teach them, you know, there's uh there's a lot of horses that, you know, have all the ability, like he's saying, they can stop, they can run, they can do all of those things, but they don't have the the mind to to, to take in the learning and try to do what we want them to, you know. Uh, so you got to have you need a you need a good mind, you need physical ability, and uh, and a lot of time spent basically. Yeah, horses, yeah. With, horses are like children, kind of. I've always thought that about them. Just a thousand pound child. Yeah, yeah. they can't talk. No. Well, when that if, well, unless you have a horse uh, clairvoyant, then they can. I was going to say, wouldn't that be better since they can't talk? Well, no, because if they could talk, we could <laughs> explain to them what we wanted to do. And see if they understand. Yeah. This is getting off track. <laughs> Definitely. Real off track. Are you That's uncomfortable? My fault. Huh? You look uncomfortable. I feel uncomfortable from that. What? I'm asking questions. questions. <laughs> what, um, yeah, what do you guys have upcoming next as far as what's the next? Because, I mean, uh, we go, work just got we done. We go but... to, uh, yeah, we just got done with the Super Stakes uh, a couple, two, three weeks ago. And, uh. Fix and leave to go to the BI. Um, it starts on the 12th of May. Yep. So the so the BI is the Breeders Invitational in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah. Um, it's usually a, about a 12, 12, 13 day show. This year it is, I think, 17 days because of COVID last year getting that show got canceled. Mm -hmm. So they add the money from last year into this year and added another age group for those horses that didn't get to show last year. Get to uh, bump them a year. They get yeah. to bump a year. Yep. So, so it's a little bit longer. Um, it's. I think it's one of everybody's favorite shows. It's a great facility in Tulsa. The city of Tulsa is good. It's got great eateries. Uh, it's a lot of fun. The the show schedule's good. Uh, so everybody has a good time there. Always a lot of tornadoes. Other than that, it's okay. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Yeah, my sister yeah, lives just outside of Tulsa. Yeah. It's, it's actually a, surprisingly nice out there. Like, it, it's, you would think that it wouldn't be, but it is kind of nice out there. Yeah, no, it's yeah, yeah. It's, it's really good. That's where that's where my Katie grew up, just north of Tulsa. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what what town is that north of Tulsa? Ulaga. Oh, yep, Ulaga. Yep, great place. Right there, north of Claremore. Yeah, Claremore too. All that, 
Great yep. place. <laughs> um, it's interesting you brought up COVID. Like, how many shows got canceled last year as far as the cutting stuff? I mean, what is the like the governing body of cutting? Were they like rodeo where they you know canceled a few but tried to carry on? Or yeah, like, everybody, eh. everybody wanted. No, everybody wanted to. I mean, you know, the show producers. Um, you know, the people that produce those shows make money off of them, so they wanted to have them, obviously, and we need them to have them so we can make money. So everybody everybody pushed to have them. Yeah. Uh, you know, just kind of canceled them out of necessity. Um, and I don't know how many would have got canceled. I know we we didn't get to have the Super Stakes. We didn't get to have the BI. Um, there, and then there was there were several of Those were the two biggest ones that got canceled, and then, and then a jillion little uh, small ones. Sure. You know. um, I know there was one in... There's one in Vegas that's right after the BI. I think it got canceled. So there's yeah, it got it it hurt, you know. Yeah. As far as showing those horses and putting the ironings on. Yeah. According to the the mayor of Vegas, they won't be canceling any more stuff there. He did a oh, party change, apparently. Yeah. yeah. He was like a lifelong Democrat uh-huh. or, or a career Democrat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He switched parties. I don't know if you saw that. No, I did not. Yeah, he left the Democratic Party because he said they're the party of socialism and that's not democracy. That was a uh, North North Vegas. Yeah, one of Vegas, dude. As a mayor, it's Las Vegas. I know there's more than one, but still, uh, this one works for my dialogue here. So. <laughs> he fits what we needed at the top. It, yeah, uh-huh. it does. I mean, he's the mayor of Vegas, and he switched parties. It's kind of a significant thing, if you think about it. North Vegas. Hi, it's, it's Las Vegas. Is the South Vegas mayor Democrat? Probably. I don't think there is a South Vegas. I'm lost. Completely lost. If there's a North Vegas, there's definitely a South Vegas. And then so then which hang, hang on, which which va- which which mayor runs the casinos? Which one's in charge of the casinos, of the strip? I think that's the independent one, from for because there's the city of Las Vegas and then there's Northern Las Vegas. Yeah. It, well, mayor, you're talking about it's North Las Vegas. Yeah. I wonder what he controls versus what that's, the other. Yeah, guy that's controls. what I'm. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, can that's, you look that up? Because yeah, that could have. I, did you know there was two mayors? I had. I had no idea. Yeah, I didn't know there was two Las Vegases. Yeah, I didn't know. That's how that lost I am. Yeah, I guess there's a North Fort Worth mayor too. Maybe. No. Oh, well, there's zero consistency. It's with Nevada. Things. It's weird. Nevada is a weird place. Definitely. Are you going to answer the question? I'm looking. So you're going to spout off, but you're not going to get the answers together. Any of those for states us. that are blue are. Here, oh. so that's what I don't know where the strip is on St. Vegas, but that's the that's North Las Vegas. That's a very small portion. It's only about two hundred fifty. Yeah, the strip's going to be in South Las Vegas. Ah, oh, so this kind of pokes some holes in this. That's a yeah. far less significant and <laughs> definitely. And, and at this point, who cares? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one cares what party you left, guy. You're not making any changes it's for not, anybody. Yeah, it's not important. It's not it's not important. It anymore. does not affect the story. In fact, I might have to cut this whole thing out because I thought we were going somewhere with that. Like, oh, they'll never cancel another thing again. Well, this guy doesn't have any say in he it. Really so why doesn't. was why was he swinging around? I mean, like he I don't was know. If do they, maybe they have a casino up there that was a lot smaller and they didn't want to cancel a singer or something. But yeah, horse events. It's not going to change anything. Supposedly not. Thomas I mean, and Mac or South Point. No, that guy yeah. changing his mind's not helping us. Yeah, no kidding. It, I mean, South Point. That was a South Point was a weird thing last year because they were like carrying on like they were going to do everything and then just pfft, nope. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and I mean, a lot of our cuttings went that way too. That we, you know, up until the last point, they were planning on having it. Yeah, you know, and then within the last four days of it coming up, they would cancel it. You yeah. know, but you had to. I mean, they had to keep pushing to try to have it, but then bad stuff kept happening. So. It was a really weird time. Very, Still weird. Definitely. Yeah. This is so many things right now that don't make sense. Like outside of the horse world, because that kind of stays consistent because of the type of people. But like mm-hmm. as a whole, what they're doing a fourth round of stimulus. Like they're purposely trying to keep people from working. Like the economy wants to continue to grow, but they don't want to let it grow. I just don't understand yeah, what's I going on. I can't keep up. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. But then people are like buying places in Weatherford for like a hundred grand over asking and, but then, I don't know. Yeah, just, yeah I don't know. It, we're just living in, like, the twilight zone. None of bit. it makes sense. A little bit. It makes more sense just to ride a horse and not look into it. Do you get really deep into it? Like, you get stuck on Fox News and things like that? Or you? So, uh, no, not recently. Yeah. Not recently. Not since the election, maybe? Exactly. Because yeah, yeah. that didn't go the way that it we that thought we it was going to go. Too. Yeah. Definitely. No, I, yeah, at one point, I, I was listening to Fox, getting the truck, Fox News right there. Hit yep. the preset, 
drive, you know, whatever we need to do. Turn it on in the house. You're going to watch. Pay attention. Now, no, I don't. It kind of screws with you, though, if you get into it, right? Like, it ruins your whole day without ever, like, it's like what they plan to do, I think. It's like they, they know they can keep you hooked and mess your day up. You're going to come back tomorrow, hope that something's better. Then it's not going to be. Yeah. And the next thing you know, you spent three months listening to them and helping their ratings, and that's all they really wanted. Pretty much. A lot of fear mongering, too. That just that keeps you hooked. Just the fear mongering. That's all the news networks yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. It's just fear mongering all around. Maybe Western Sports Roundup needs to do a little bit more of that. <laughs> it attracts some of the fear younger. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> fear monger. Oh, just so you know, the rodeo might be gone or whatever we're talking about today might be gone. Watch next time to find out. <laughs> yeah, find out if it's going to be gone. 3,000% increase in their viewership. All right. How do, you think, how do you think soap operas keep people? That's actually a great question. Are those soap operas still exist? Yes, they do. Middays. My mom has been watching uh, Days of Our Lives for 20 plus years now. What? What? Well, you said your mom and you. No, no, my mom has. I haven't watched them. That's not what you said. I did not say that. That's what he said, huh, Taryn? Uh, you know, I'm not really sure what. I was still lost in that <laughs> Days of Our Lives is still going on. I had no idea. Yeah, I didn't either. The little thing with the hourglass, I do remember that when I was a sm- You guys remember that from being a little kid, right? Like barely, vaguely. Well, I mean, I, just, I, I do remember occasionally that it would be on, like if you came in for lunch or something. But, yeah. I mean, I, I, I can't say that I've ever seen an episode of Days of Our Lives, but I seriously Never. did not know that it was even a thing anymore. That's almost embarrassing. Like who is keeping them in business? His mom. And him, apparently. <laughs> and, and him, according to you. His mom. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I well. mean the they keep running, and then whenever occasionally I get notifications for like NBC, DFW, uh, that Days of Our Lives has been preempt. Oh, and every I just I hear see people on Twitch freak out for some reason. Yeah, it's like when you know when the people freak out that the Bachelor got preempted because a tornado is happening. Mm-mm. Have you ever seen that The Bachelor? Like t- TV shows that like happen at prime time. No. I don't, People I don't have watch, complained. I don't go watch back to network TV. Go, go back to The Bachelor. I don't care about this tornado. No, I'm I lost. seriously don't know what he's talking I'm about. Lost. Like I'm trying to be nice and like nod, but I don't know what you're talking I don't about. Know about this. Yeah, it's fine. I don't even know what preempt means since we're cutting this. Preempt means it just it, so it just goes over. It cancels the show. Oh, we're not cutting this. This will be out there. <laughs> just going. You're gonna have to catch me up. Yeah. I'm lost. Yeah, I don't, I'm lost. I'm, I don't. I don't, I don't watch The Bachelor. Days of Our Lives. <laughs> I don't tweet. So yeah, I'm I don't think I. Lost I don't think I know a single person who makes a living riding horses who watches Days of Our Lives or The Bachelor. I don't just. Well, you're too busy to watch. See that happening. <laughs> Whose sister? Yours. How do you know? <laughs> well, apparently you know something about my sister I don't, Riley. <laughs> See, this is what happens here. Things get real off track. You said, hey, do you have a plan? Mm-mm, nope. We're going to talk about things that don't make any sense or have anything to do with why you're actually here. I got you. So I'll apologize for that, but hopefully the free beer covers for that. But, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you might need more of those when we leave. Well, you take all of them for your time, sir. Yeah, no yeah. worries. I made fun of your shirt. We talked about The Bachelor. This is not good. <laughs> so you the, what, there's you a six-pack. You take them. There you go. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I actually do appreciate you coming in and actually very interested to – talk to you and more people who do what you do because I actually find the cutting horse thing to be really fascinating because I mean, it's the way those horses move. It's just super unique. and You know, they, they, like, they say it's like one of the most addicting things that you can do on, on a horse. Really? It is right, a cutting horse for, for like that, for that reason. I think that the horses, you know, taking over and reading the cow and like I was saying earlier, the, the, difficulty of it but they say it's one of the most if you could ever get on a cutting horse once yeah everybody's hooked really they love it yeah, yeah. i mean is you would know this riley is cutting bigger than barrel it's bigger than barrel racing and team rope i think is it the behind you know I, I is it the second biggest horse I mean, I, discipline I don't, I don't know i don't know that you could say that it's bigger than barrel racing or team roping because yeah, i mean as far as just people who do it i mean it's got to be up there uh, no i mean i don't think there would be more people that cut than either Barrel race or team rope because really? be, well because to me there's it's it's cheaper to go to a barrel race and you can you can go to a barrel race and enter for sixty dollars you can go to a team rope and then rope all day on two hundred yeah you know so so to me there's definitely more people there might be there might be more 
there might be more money in the cutting because of sure. the, the horses and the selling and the you know the buying and the people that own them and stuff like that. But I think there's more actual people that would team rope or barrel race. Because there's probably um, I, maybe you're right. Maybe I'm I'm not thinking about this correctly. There's probably less weekend you know hobbyist right normal job people who probably do cutting. Right? Definitely yes, definitely. To, I mean. I think just like we were saying earlier, the the fact that everything changes so much during a cutting run, it yeah. takes more practice. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that it's any any more difficult than those other ones to be successful at. Right. If you're going to be a top barrel racer, top team rope, or whatever, it's very difficult to get to that level. Oh, absolutely. You, and you have to practice and ride constantly, no doubt. But I think the fact that it changes so much in a run, it takes more more time and practice as far as trying to 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 get to that level than maybe it does the the weekend barrel racer or team roper. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I would be considered a weekend team roper, and I can have my one horse and go to the jackpot and go rope for a couple hundred bucks and have a blast. Yeah. And to go to a cutting, you spend $200 going to the cut, and you're going to show once. Yep. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I mean, it's the upfront investments. These are just little nuances I don't really know. Uh, yeah. That, that makes so a the, lot yeah, of sense. So, yeah, if you go to a, if you go to a cutting – and you know that you're the cheapest entry fee you're going to find is going to be 235, you know, 250 at a weekend show. Yeah. In a in a small class per head. Per yeah, yeah per for one entry exactly. Yeah. So so you know, I mean, I think that's the that's the difference right there is that you can go to the you can go to the barrel race and take two or three horses and for $240, you're going to go run a way. lot of barrels. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you yeah, know what I mean? True. You're gonna, yeah. You know, you get your exhibitions and your, you know, and then the actual race and everything. So I think that's the. I think that's why there's more people that can. Yeah, that can it's more accessible. That. Is what it yeah, is. Exactly, and to to cut, you need cow pens. There's so much that goes along with it, and if you have a a horse and a little space, you can throw some barrels out there and and start. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So there's just more that goes along with the cutting, and I, so I think there's more. Do you people think it deters younger people from wanting to do it? Because it's. I mean, it's real hard to get started. I mean, like if you're just somebody who says, "Wow, I'd like to start cutting." I mean, when you say all these things, it makes it seem like it's real hard to get into. So, I mean, it it, it is and it isn't. Uh, uh, like I said, I think if 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 more people just came and came and did it, jump on a horse and and go at it, there yeah. are people all around the world that are very very willing to help anybody learn to cut i mean and there are people all the way from oregon to the to the east coast california i mean everywhere that that'll jump in and teach people that are beginners and and a lot of people i mean i've got a couple two or three horses at my place that that i would be very comfortable putting a very beginner on and start teaching them how to cut that you know that horses that i own right so and, and most people are that way that they have at least one or two horses at their place that they own most trainers that if somebody wanted to learn that they could come and start getting a lesson, you know what I'm sure. saying? So, so, I mean, I, I think, I think there's that perception of that. It may be a little harder to get into that type of thing, but I don't think it, I don't think it is if somebody really wanted to do it. Sure. Yeah. I guess it's all about priorities. Ex yeah, exactly. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, no, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's super, certainly intriguing. I'm probably going to try it at some point. Well, come on. Yeah. I got a baseball What's player. What's holding that you I back? Me well, I just didn't have, hadn't had this conversation yet in my life, go. and yeah. so now my eyes are open. I think, yeah. I, I think I know a baseball player that I need to bring out from Florida to do it too. Absolutely, yeah. We'll yeah, have to come that? to your place. His name's Ian Desmond. Bring he's, him on. He's obsessed with horses. He just retired, so he'll be a. Uh, I think cutting would probably be. I've been teach, teaching him how to rope, and now he's like practicing. He's buying horses and trailers and doing the whole thing. But I think cutting might be the thing to have him do. That's awesome. Yeah, he would love it. I think he would. Yeah. yeah. So we've actually, um, me, a uh, couple friends of mine, Matt Miller and Clint Allen, we got to do a very cool deal a couple years ago. Uh, we actually got to do a clinic type type day for for a group of seals. Oh, that and sounds they awesome. Yeah, and they came out, and uh, me and me and Matt and Clint put together a group of there. I think there was twelve guys that came. So we had, I think we, I think we came up with like thirteen horses between the three of us active that, duty guys or retired guys active duty oh that's real cool yeah and they uh they came out and uh and we got to kind of give them you know give them a little a little start in cutting some of them had rode before mm -hmm. uh some of them had never rode some of them hadn't been around a horse at all <laughs> and uh and we got to spend the day with them guys kind of coaching on them and riding by the end of the day they had all worked a cow they'd all rode they'd all rope the dummy i mean we had a, yeah we had a blast and you know just just like that like say within a two-week period buddy of mine called and said these guys were coming 
let's do it. Yeah. And we put together 13 horses that these guys could ride. Do you right. know what I'm saying? It's, if somebody really wants to do it, a couple of phone calls or just knowing somebody that's even close to it, yeah, you can get involved. I mean, isn't that what's great about the Western world? Because it certainly wouldn't be the other way around, right? Like, you're not going to have access to, like, the Texas Rangers to learn baseball. No, and, absolutely. Yeah, that's what's great about, like, just the Western world as a whole. You could go to a top guy like yourself or any top roper or barrel racer. They're, they're so accessible. You could walk right up to them. Hey, would you teach me some stuff? And, like, five people anywhere are going to say no. Everyone wants to help people. Exactly. In this industry. Yeah, no doubt. So that's, no doubt. it makes I it kind agree. of it's kind of unique in what separates us from like every other thing. I agree. Well, I'll say this: as much as we rag on Ryan and yeah. enjoy that, I can pull up to Ryan's place and he'll say, "Unload your horse and come on, come rope." Yeah. And if you don't have a horse, he's probably going to say, "Here, jump on this one." Yeah. Which is a way better idea. His is going to be way better than ours. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? I mean, you can. We're not ropers, right? But he's going to jump in there and help you. Yep. He's going to extremely torture you throughout the day, but he's going to help you, you know? And same thing. You're not going to pull up to Ian Desmond's house and ask him to throw you some pitches. No. Absolutely not. Yeah. Nope, not going to happen. It's not not, not happen. any major league baseball player or no. football player. You don't mess with that. Exactly. So, yeah, so yeah, I think that's that's one of the cool things about the Western Heritage, like you said. Yeah, it really is. It's just the the best in the world are immediately accessible and always will help. And I think that's just something special about it doesn't matter if it's cutting or, or barrel racing or just whatever. You know, people are accessible and everybody wants to help. I agree. Well, I'm glad you came here. This was really informative and actually a lot of fun. Probably not as much fun for you as it was for me and Ty. <laughs> no, it but good. it uh it was good. Thank you. Thank you guys for Thank coming. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, you guys can go get it. some dinner in Fort Worth or something? Absolutely. Where are you gonna yep. go? Eddie V's if we can get in. Really? Yeah. Mother's Day is tomorrow. Slightly dropped the ball on getting a uh, reservation. Whoops. So when I called a little bit ago, they, were, they weren't taken anymore. But I don't know what time it is, but I feel like we can maybe get in. So she's got, like, piercing eyes, and they're, she can't see you. She's looking at me, so I'm getting the look that you're supposed to be getting. But, yeah, you should probably <laughs> have called to try to make a reservation before you walk Definitely. through here. Definitely. Yeah. Well, well, like we How many saying, kids do you guys have? Two. Two kids. Yeah, and they're with my mom. Ah, yeah. So, yeah, so we're going to go to Fort Worth. Go Mother's, Day, Mother's Day times two. Yeah. Should have called. Double the fuck ups. Yeah. My bad. Yeah. <laughs> You're bad. Sorry. She was Def looking at me and I yeah. feel bad. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> well, yeah. we'll let you guys get to that and hopefully the wait's not too terribly long. Awesome. For Thank your you. sake. Appreciate it. <laughs> oh, brother, let's go down. This has been The Gage, hosted by me, Chance Conrado, produced and edited by our guy Ty Yeager. Shout out to the executive producers, Dustin Pointer and Cody Denton. Marketing and content produced by Riley Chone. Our theme song is by Shay Ashire and the Night Howlers. Make sure to rate and review this podcast as well as follow The Gage on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And make sure to subscribe to The Gage wherever you get your podcast. We'll see you guys next time.